The world is changing at breathtaking speeds, with trends and fads popping up and passing away at breakneck pace. Against that backdrop of nearly constant upheaval, we welcome you to the Sunday Scotch Society. Over delectable, sumptuous scotches and with the occasional good cigar in hand, we have open, honest, and uninhibited conversation about whatever strikes our fancy. Whether it's the critical issue of the day or a deep dive down the rabbit hole, we take it all seriously while having a good time. Join us for a stiff drink and a great conversation. Greetings, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Sunday Scotch Society. Uh, Today, uh, I'm riding solo. It is I, your indubitable host, K. Quincy Parker, and uh, Matthew uh, will be back with me next week uh, for our regular convivium. Today, I am uh, excited to chat with you about uh, my trip to London and uh, some of the amazing things that happened there. And I'm looking forward to unpacking a lot of that uh, in this arena. Uh, But the thing that makes the Sunday Scotch Society unique and special and uh, so much fun is uh, our exploration of these single malt whiskeys, these blended whiskeys, these bourbons, these uh, other uh, drams and, and, and wonderful cordials that we taste from around the, around the world. And uh, one of the things that I was particularly excited about uh, when I went to London was uh, an opportunity to visit the Whiskey Exchange. Now, uh, whiskey drinkers uh, who are listening know that uh, the Whiskey Exchange is one of these uh, sources of commentary on whiskey uh, that have come to occupy sort of a place of honor uh, in terms of the respectability uh, and believability of their reviews Uh, and their commentary on the whiskey world. And so while I was in London, I I found myself on the Strand. uh, And let me tell you something. We're going to talk about the Strand. Um, But I was strolling uh, along the Strand, and I came to the Whiskey Exchange, and I was like, well, I mean, you know, this is a, this this is almost as if it were a pilgrimage designed from the beginning of my intention to visit London. Uh, it wasn't until I was on the Strand that I remembered that the Whiskey Exchange is a London publication. And so I looked for it, and it was like nine minutes away from where I was. I was like, oh, absolutely. So uh, I, I walked across to the Whiskey Exchange, and uh, walked in, determined that I was going to make at least a purchase from this uh, this iconic uh, source of whiskey wisdom. And uh, prior to going to uh, the whiskey exchange, uh, I had been, of course, reading up on their whiskeys of the year and their ultimate winner uh and i i bought a bottle of the loch lomond 18 year old single malt scotch whiskey uh which is the whiskey of the year for 2024 uh as selected by the whiskey exchange in london and i decided that I would taste that single malt with you here today on the Sunday Scotch Society. Uh, Matthew is going to absolutely lambaste me uh, for doing it uh, on a solo show, but I will, and I will accept my beating with good grace and, uh, and ultimately beg his forgiveness. 
But uh, before we open up and uh, and taste, uh, I I want to. I want to sort of set the stage, right? Um, the Whiskey Exchange points out that choosing just one whiskey to celebrate, of course, is never easy, but uh, their panel of industry experts and attendees at the judging event in London, which I missed, oh, I'm going to try and be there for the next one, uh, it, it, they whittled it down the short list, uh, they whittled down to a short list of six uh no so they had a short list of six whiskeys and they chose ultimately the Loch Lomond as uh as the whiskey of the year and uh they according to the whiskey exchange you know it, it's a perfect representation of Loch Lomond's signature style uh w- which we'll get to as 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 we as we have our conversation but uh According to the Whiskey Exchange, this single malt has been matured in three types of American oak casks for 18 years, creating its full-bodied and fruity character. The nose brings, well, we'll talk about what the nose uh, brings to me on a personal level once I, once I open up and, and, uh, and taste it. But uh, in case you were curious about what else was on the short list, uh, the other single malts uh, that were in the running for Whiskey of the Year were the Aaron Sherry Cask, the Balblair 15-year-old, the Jura 18-year-old red wine finish, which is something I'm going looking for uh, as soon as uh, this opportunity arises, uh, the Glenallachy 15-year-old, and the Glen Lassau uh, Sand End. And uh, those were the other five that were on the top uh, six shortlist. And uh, as I can get my hands on them uh, over the next, uh, however long it is, uh, we, will, uh, we will try to review those whiskeys as well. Uh, and also, this I think is fascinating, just for information purposes. Some of the previous winners, and uh, and you'll you'll I think you'll like this. Uh, first is uh, the Kilcoman Machir, uh, the Machir Machir Bay, I think it's called. Uh, uh, pronounced the Kilcoman Machir Bay uh, was the. Uh, what was that? That's 22, 23, 2, 1. Uh, no, that's because that one was 15. So I'm not sure what year that was. Uh, but that's a former whiskey of the year, and you can buy that here in town. Uh, then there's the Bowmore 15. Uh, I've seen the Bowmore 10s here. Um, then there's a Michter's, uh US 1 Unblended uh, American whiskey. Then there's the Port Charlotte 10 year old by um, uh, Brooklady. And you can buy that. I know where you can get that. You can get that one at Jimmy's uh, Wines and Spirits. Uh, and it's a former whiskey of the year, according to uh, the, uh, the fine folks at the London uh, the Whiskey Exchange. Then the. the The Deanston 18-year-old uh, verse. And then finally, there was something called the Ledeg 18-year-old. Those are some former winners or previous winners of the Whiskey Exchange uh, Whiskey of the Year. And of that list, two of them you can go out and buy uh, here in Nassau. And uh, I think that's pretty dang cool. Uh, again, you can get the Port Charlotte at Jimmy's, and I've seen the Kilcoman Macker Bay. I've seen that at Liquid Courage. Uh, so, yeah, it's. I mean, it's a good time to be a whiskey drinker here in uh, in these Isles of June, as they, as uh, some people used to call them. So, anyway, uh, I'd like to start with the the thing that we like to do. Uh, here's the uh, quintessential moment, the opening of the whiskey. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Woo! Oh my goodness. Oh wow. Oh my goodness. Oh wow. Okay, so the nose, according to the tasting notes, uh, we're looking for green apple, grapefruit, honeysuckle, and oak. And as I pour, but even before I pour it, I just smelling the bottle, I, I can definitely get the oak and I definitely get the green apple. And uh, you know that normally I uh, take my scotch neat, but today I am doing it with uh, a single ice cube, and um, we'll see. So, in the glass, the nose, uh, oh, definitely there's the grapefruit. It's almost a heather uh, smoke type thing maybe that's maybe that's the honeysuckle i'm not sure but it, it it reads rather than floral it reads to me as smoky and and uh and a little herbaceous but there's definitely a sweetness and uh and a richness from the oakiness that's uh, from the and a richness from the oak that i i, I detect okay mm. that smells wonderful all right, and now we are going to wet our lips just a little, just to coat the tongue, as Reed Parker likes to say, just so our taste buds are not shocked by our first real sip, and that we can actually taste what we're tasting. Mm -hmm. there's definitely an interesting mix there the balance between sweetness and smokiness and earthiness and a little fruitiness there is really extraordinary So the bottle, so, you know, in terms of tasting notes on the bottle, it, it talks about caramelized apple and wood smoke. And I will, I will admit, the smoke is what I think is the most pronounced right away. And then the alcohol. But then once you... Once you you get those f flavor components over with, the next thing that you get is that fruity sweetness. I I would say toffee. I would say a baked apple but not a baked green apple a baked red apple you know there's a, a bit of it, it the, the the tasting notes mention tobacco but i again that's i read that as earthiness rather than 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 tobacco ness uh tobacco notes excuse me um so overall my first impression is that it, it is a an in incredible balance between sweet and smoky that kind of rides the that perfect line there that gives you a an overall sense that that you could drink this single malt whiskey for 
a long time that you could sit with this and just let flavors develop and let things happen. It's really, it's really exquisite. Uh, I can, I can see, I can see how this would make a, a very strong case for, for a, an award-winning whiskey. It, it really is quite extraordinary. And like I say, you know, I, uh, I, I encountered it, acquired it in London. And I thought that, you know, today I would take a, a few minutes and, um, I guess do not necessarily report. This is not a travelogue because I'm already home. But I guess I wanted to talk about a couple of things that happened while I was in London that I thought were uh, interesting and worthy of uh, worthy of sharing in this arena, and maybe even some some comment. You know, uh, <laughs> one of the first things that I I found fascinating was how close. The other side of the world really is. It only took an eight-hour flight direct from the Linden Pilling International Airport to uh, London Heathrow uh, for me to go from the Bahamas to the capital of the United Kingdom. And... When you look at a map and you see those 5,000 miles or however long it is, and you see that there's a whole ocean um, between our side of the world and that side of the world, you, you, you get this sense of vast, immense distance, which, which is objectively true. And the the reality is we're talking many, many thousands of miles. But in the strange world that we live in, with the types of transportation options that we have, sometimes it is astounding when you realize how small the world has become, how accessible, maybe is a better way to say it, how accessible the world has become, especially from a country like the Bahamas, which is a significant, uh, you know, air hub for air travel, transcontinental and inter interhemisphere travel, you know, like literally on Thursday, I hopped on a plane and in eight hours, I had flown from the Bahamas to London, across the Atlantic Ocean. And all I had to deal with uh, was a, a slight bit of jet lag. And to me, that is it's just a fascinating observation. And to... to to extrapolate from from it a little bit more, I mean, you could hit um, just by day trip Wales, Ireland, France, Belgium, you know, just by virtue of being in London, you have access to these other places in terms of, you just hop on a train and you can, like, you know, one of my uh, friends who was with me in London got up 
super early in the morning, hopped on a train, went to Paris, sent us a picture from the Eiffel Tower, and then was back in London by early afternoon. What? The world is that small? The world is that accessible? You could, you could, you could do that? You could just go to one place, hop on a train and hit another place and then come back to that other place with that little trouble? It feels like there's, there's almost no excuse for insularity. There's no excuse, it feels like, to not go exploring. It's insane. It, it feels so strange. But, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was something that really made me, um, really made me think, you know? It was part of my, my contemplation. So, this whiskey has had a chance to open up a little bit, uh, sitting in the glass, and the sweetness is a lot more pronounced now. Um, that might be the influence of the ice cube, I don't know, but that initial... Uh, the initial like sort of pointedness of the alcohol uh, has kind of bled off a bit and what's left is the smokiness and the sweetness and, and a little bit of fruity uh, so yeah so I really like it good stuff um, so back to back to London you know um, the other thing aside from how accessible the world has become one of the things that I found really uh, noticeable about London was how diverse a city it is and how in a way the city celebrates that diversity uh, and and in the Bahamas we know about you know diversity. We know about h having a, a melting pot culture, right? That's what that's that's what we are, you know. And, and and in London there were many of the same cultures represented, right? But but I, if I if I go down, okay, so I'm going to attempt a short list just based on some of the food I ate, or maybe not, because I mean. I read somewhere that there are more than 280 ethnic groups and nationalities represented in in the in London, which I mean, come on, I mean, come on, that's more than the number of countries represented in the United Nations. That which last count I think was somewhere around 191 countries, 195 maybe. Um, that many different ethnic groups and nationalities cheek by jowl in one city and you, you walk around the streets and you feel it it's, it's right there uh, the South Asian uh, influence is there the, the the continental European influence is there. The African influence is there. So is the Caribbean influence. Uh, and and what's what was really mind blowing to me, freaked me out, was the prevalence of the American fast food culture. Dude, I saw a KFC in London's Covent Garden. I know if you hear what I say. I say I saw Kentucky Fried Chicken in the theater district of London. <laughs> I, I almost my neck almost twisted, like my neck was almost cramped so fast. I how fast I twisted my head when I saw it. I said, what? But it was just it was evidence of 
how diverse a city London is. And, and, and I will tell you this, walking around in London, it was one of the few places that I have been outside the Bahamas where I walked around as a black man and did not feel anybody taking particular note of my blackness. Where I walk into shops and did not feel anyone paying attention to my skin color or anything else, right? Uh, I, I, I really was prepared internally to to deal with what I expected to be subtle racism. But I was shocked beyond beyond measure that I did not I did not feel any of that at all. And 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 when you think about how how diverse a city London is, I suppose it makes sense. I suppose it makes sense. Um I mean, obviously at some point the the defeat of the Tories and the victory of the Labour government and the emergence of Keir Starmer and his crew as, you know, the, the new leadership in, in, in the UK uh, may come up in future conversations. But just when you consider the diversity of London's politics, you know, who has been in power, who is in power, and their ethnic backgrounds... And just the sheer, as I say, diversity of the of the ethnicities that have held the reins of power in London, in the UK, in in the last fifteen twenty years, is, I guess, reflected in the in the city at large. And it was a really interesting experience as a traveler, uh, as a Bahamian, as a black man to be in that city. And one of the things that I kept thinking was, how is it that in this city, where there are more than 280 different nationalities and ethnicities present and accounted for, and I'm talking just individuals, I'm talking communities, not just one family, but whole communities that represent you know an ethnicity or a nationality right more than 280 of them <laughs> all in one city why is it that we in in our country where our our melting pot is full of people who look like us or who don't look that different from us and whose life experience is not that different from ours. Why is it that there is still so much resentment and so much friction between the ethnic groups that together make up what is the modern Bahamas? I found myself really contemplating how different it is to be in a city where people work together. People work together for clearly defined goals and without consideration for and I know it's it, I know it seems naive it sounds naive and it might even be naive but this is genuinely how I felt at the moment you know was working together for common goals without reference to ethnicity at all only with regard to capability and capacity can you get the job done do we believe the same things fundamentally can we work on a team together and pull in the same direction? If yes, let's move forward. 
and and I just I really found that uh, to be a I guess something of a case study for what uh, what I would like to see in the Bahamas someday. Uh, obviously, you know it is not that day and today. <laughs> You know, but it is something to which I aspire uh, I, on our behalf as as a nation that we can embrace our ethnic differences and recognize that they make us unique and special, but also embrace our national unity. And recognize and appreciate that we are stronger together. Here endeth the reading. World without end. Amen. Let the church say amen. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, that scotch is good. All right. So the next uh, sort of element of my trip to London that I thought was fascinating was the performance you know what before I before I get to that next part I think it's time I'm gonna have another pour of the Loch Lomond 18 I'm going to have this one neat. See if there's an appreciable difference. And how the flavor develops over the course of the rest of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's back. Oh, oh man. So without the ice, the sweetness is, it is almost, wow, it's almost like doubled in intensity, the sweetness part. I so taste that apple and that toffee alongside the 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 really pointed alcohol forward nature of a single malt whiskey. Oh, I should drink this neat all the time. This is so good. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so <clears throat> in 2003, I was uh, singing with the Tulsa Opera. And uh, in that season, we did... Verdi's opera Rigoletto and uh, Donizetti's opera Le Lilizier d'Amore, The Elixir of Love. And a, a tradition in opera uh, is that you bring in, uh, along with your established stars, you bring in young. Uh, promising up-and-comers to uh, give them experience singing roles on a stage with a live audience but with uh, with minimal risk to their careers if things don't go well right um, and one of the young artists that Carol Crawford brought in uh, to the Tulsa Opera for that, that season was uh, a young black tenor named Russell Thomas. Now, I sang, you know, a couple of compromario roles in that season, and Russell sang uh, some of the smaller roles in all the shows. And, uh, you know, we had a really great time singing together and hanging out, uh, as he did with the whole, you know, Tulsa Opera Company. And uh, I thought he was 
really good. And then, you know, that season ended and, you know, he moved on with his life. I moved on with mine. Fast forward to sitting in the Royal Opera House in London on Monday. I would, I guess that would have been the 7th of July and reading the name Russell Thomas singing the lead role in Tosca at the Royal Opera House and being so blown away by how amazing a performance Russell gave and realizing afterwards that wait a minute this Russell Thomas I know this guy I didn't know before going to the show that it was him I only recognized that it was him after I followed him on Instagram and I looked at the name and I was like man this name is familiar to me so I googled the name and the thing popped up with Tulsa. Because I was like, did, I, did he sing in Tulsa at some point? And so I googled Russell Thomas Tulsa. And it popped up. And I was like, this is that guy. I know this guy. We sang together. I have a picture of he and I on stage together with other cast members from Rigoletto in 2003. I'm like, wow. Wow, a guy I sang with singing the lead role in one of the biggest operas of all time in one of the most impressive and important opera houses in the world. I was sitting in the audience while he did it and he killed it. He freaking killed it. He was so good. I was like, wow. And it was just it was one of those moments, you know, where you you consider, I mean, I don't want to say what if, right? Because what if seems to carry with it regret. And I don't regret my life choices because they gave me Kylie Boy, Kyle the Warrior, my hero, my boy. They gave me years and years of, of the the ability to watch Maya, Camille, my daughter, grow and blossom. They gave me years of happy and fulfilled marriage with, with Suzette. They gave me all kinds of, you know, positive things. But there was definitely a path. Excuse me. So I'd say maybe there's an alternative universe, uh, you know, an alternate timeline, you know, let's say, out there where... I followed where I followed my career as an opera singer through to its conclusion. And in that alternate timeline, I, I am convinced, and I think it's hilarious, that, the, that Russell singing Cavaradossi and... K. Quincy Parker singing Scarpia in the same production of Tosca. Uh, that's a thing in that alternate timeline. And it's like, life life is really funny. Because sometimes things smack you in the face and tell you uh, this is what you need to do. This is, you know, God can be subtle, but God can also be really blunt. You know, and, and 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 I felt I don't know. I still haven't really, you know. And this is a little personal, but I still haven't really finished chewing over what what I what I learned from that or took away from that. But what I wanted to share with with this uh, community is. that dreams come true. My friend Russell wanted to be 
a world-class, world-renowned operatic tenor. And he busted his butt and worked hard enough that between 2003, he went from being an obscure, no-name tenor uh, brought in uh, to a bee house in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to being the lead performer at the Royal Opera House in London in one of Puccini's biggest operas. And he killed it. And it was, it felt inevitable. It felt as though things could not have gone any other way. So, all that is to to say that I I was with a, a group of people who were singers, and and I really, and I hope that all the performers who are listening to the to the pod today really hear me and and take what I'm saying to heart. It is entirely possible, entirely possible, that you could live your dreams if you stay committed to what you're doing, you work hard, and you do what you have to do to advance your craft. You can live your dream. You can live your dreams. I don't think people tell you that. People tell you to dream big. People tell you that you're supposed to dream because young men have, you know, visions and old men dream, dream, or whatever. The st- people tell you to have this amazing imagination and, and to picture yourself doing all these wonderful things. But then they tell you to grow up. Or then they tell you to get real. I am telling you right here, right now, you could do what you dream of doing. I saw my friend do it. To an extent, I've done it myself. I still have dreams. And that's that was the biggest thing that, that London gave me, was uh, permission to acknowledge that I still have dreams. And that I'm still chasing them, even at 51. Yeah, I'm 51. I know. It's a shock, isn't it? So I'm going to say it again, courtesy of Russell Thomas and Kay Quincy Parker. You, Mr. Performer, you, Miss Performer, could live your dream. Mm. imagine it see it and just imagine what it would be like to do the thing you dreamed about doing Russell stood on the stage of the okay so there are a couple of there may be like a handful there's the La Scala in Milan there's the Sydney Opera House. There's the New York Met, the Metropolitan Opera House. There's Lincoln Center. There's, if you know, there's St. Petersburg Opera. There's La Fenice. And... There's the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. It's one of those opera houses that people dream their whole lives of being asked to perform at. 
and my friend Russell went from being a no-name tenor to singing the lead in a, one of the world's biggest operas on that stage. You cannot tell me that you cannot live your dream and that I can't live mine. This scotch is... <laughs> this scotch is so good. All right, Loch Lomond, L-O-C-H, Loch Lomond, L-O-M-O-N-D, uh, single malt scotch whiskey. Uh, I got it from uh, the Whiskey Exchange in London. I don't think... Uh, I've, I know I haven't seen it here in the Bahamas yet, um, but I think that's only a, a matter of time. So if you have a friend in London, have them pick you up a bottle. But... Uh, this is yeah it's it's toffee it's it's apples it's uh caramel it's smoke it's a little dry tobacco uh so you get that herbaceous leafiness but without being green it's so good it's so good it's so good mm. so i tried it neat after having it with an ice cube and actually, I prefer it neat. The ice cube sort of amplified and emphasized the smokiness of it. it. It tilted the balance. I think that's the best way to say it. It tilted the balance away from uh, overt sweetness to a more subtle sort of almost a sweet aftertaste. But having it neat... Uh, it had time to develop with the, you know, sort of the air in the room without losing any of its, uh, I guess, character. And, and in that way, it, it was tasted that way, the, the sweetness from the, of the caramel and, and the toffee and the apple, all of that, stayed focused and concentrated in in the sip and so i think that is that is why i prefer this whiskey neat as opposed to uh having it with the ice cube but either way it's incredible whiskey mm. yeah man that's good so I won't talk about the food uh, over much. Or maybe I will. I don't know. Who knows? But one of the things that I really want to, to say is that, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put some, I'm going to share uh, some music with you guys. So we were in Westminster Abbey uh, for an even song that was uh, held in celebration of the 51st anniversary of Bahamian independence. And I want to take this moment uh, to say happy anniversary, uh, happy independence uh, to uh, all of you who are listening to the pod. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, on this journey. Uh, thank you for your commitment to making the Bahamas uh, the, the jewel that it is, it is intended to be. Thank you for committing yourselves to forward upward onward together and and for your commitment to our national development and national ideals these things are so important and uh, and one of the things okay so before i get back to westminster abbey um since we're talking about independence you know, it, it is, for me, a constant sort of 
stream of comment or, or a, a constant theme of conversation that there's a reason Americans feel American. There's a reason Russians feel Russian and Germans feel German and Brits feel Brit British. And that reason is that they learn their national history as they are children becoming thinking sentient beings. They are taught from a young age, from as young as it can be assumed that they will retain, understand, and internalize the information. They are taught the history of their people with the intention that they believe this is what makes their people great. And if you are raised with your national history alongside your mother's milk, it is only natural that you come to believe that you are a part of the history that you are raised on. It is only natural that you come to see yourself as a part of the narrative that you are being taught. And as we continue to move forward in this century, as we continue to celebrate one Independence Day after another, in the absence of a real focus on teaching Bahamian children the history of Bahamian heritage, I continue to wonder what it is that our community expects to be different. The fact is, we don't give Bahamian children or children born in the Bahamas any reason to feel like that is a special thing. If anybody believes that it is a special thing to be Bahamian, they come to that as an adult after having experienced what it's like to be elsewhere. They're not raised, we are not raised with that sense of Bahamian is special. Unless our parents believe that in their bones, and usually it's because they've been elsewhere and seen what's out there, and they come home and say, what we have here is precious, and they try to create that sense of Bahamian specialness in their children and anybody that they have influence over. But the reality is, in these other countries, you learn your national exceptionalism in school. And in the Bahamian school system, rather than making it an accusation, I'll make it a question. Are we showing our students what it means to be Bahamian? Are we telling them this is why you are special? This community stands for X, Y, Z. These values define what it is to be a Bahamian. Here is how people have lived out these values in the course of the development of our independent nation. Even before independence, being Bahamian meant X, Y, Z. Are we giving our children a reason to love this country? So, Westminster Abbey. Now, I grew up Baptist. And then I went to 
uh, Bahamas Faith Ministries for a good number of years. Then when I went off to college, uh, I was hired as the bass section leader uh, for an Episcopal choir. Uh, and I fell in love with the Episcopal service, the Anglican service. And so now I'm a, a, a chorister at Christ Church Cathedral. I'm a good Anglican boy, I suppose. Uh, although I still have a lot to learn about the Anglican you know, traditions. But Westminster Abbey is kind of... It's kind of the headquarters <laughs> for Anglicanism. And as a, a choral creature... Someone who likes choir music and likes singing in choirs and likes writing choir music, the the opportunity to hear the choir at Westminster Abbey perform at Even Song was so incredible. So what I'm going to do to close this show today is I'm going to let you hear a couple of uh, excerpts from the choir performing at Westminster Abbey. Uh, in fact, let me do that now, because I know I can talk long. So, yeah, here is the Westminster Abbey Choir. Yeah, so that uh, that is clearly, I mean, that's gorgeous music, isn't it? And gorgeous singing. That is the uh, Kyrie and the Our Father from Evensong, recorded on my cell phone, uh, hidden underneath the program. Uh, so please don't sue me, Westminster Abbey. Um, here's a bit of the Magnificat. So, London was a major moment for me 
and I'm really, really glad that I had the opportunity to uh, to go and sing, to hear my music performed. We'll talk more about that as the weeks go by. And uh, most importantly for today's purposes, uh, I'm glad I had an opportunity to stop by the Whiskey Exchange and pick up this beautiful bottle of the Loch Lomond 18 and uh, to share the opportunity uh, with you to, uh, to talk about it and to talk about some of the things that struck me as important with regard to my trip to London. Thank you for your time and energy, and I will uh, see you next time with Matthew uh, back in, in the saddle. And until then, you know, have a great time. God bless. Believe in yourself. Believe in your dreams. And, and really, truly commit yourself to uh, making them a reality. I, I, I certainly will be. That's what I'll be doing in the yeah, meantime. Yeah. While I sip on this incredibly delicious, uh, fruity and sweet and smoky uh, single malt whiskey. Das Darovia. <laughs>